much for being with us. If you're new, um, a couple of things. One, what uh, Jacob said about the marriage conference, I just want to really encourage you. If you are married or want to be married or uh, married and wish you weren't married or just, you know, you fit in those one of those three categories, um, I want to encourage you to come. And here's the deal. If you're married, there is no other relationship besides your relationship with Christ that you should bring more attention, focus and discipline to than your marriage. We neglect our marriages to our own detriment. And so I, you might say, well, what are they going to tell me? It's going to be uncomfortable. I, I, you know, you, you might have a lot of pushback. Line of, uh, I don't know. I don't want to go, especially if you're a man. And I would say the best thing you can do is put yourself in a graceful environment where we're all in the same place. Every person in here is married to a sinner. And so why not come and learn how do sinners relate to each other in marriage that's led by the friend of sinners, Jesus himself. So sign up for that. Don't miss this opportunity. Uh, one more little update I need to give you. Back in September, uh, I met and our elders met with a bunch of our leaders. And we told them about our financial position over the last couple of years, since, 20, since the end of 2019, the beginning of COVID until now. And then in December, I made an announcement to all of you about it. We sent out an, an email update. It was in there for several different weeks, so you could see the announcement and things like that. And in December, we let you all know that all the options are on the table, including the selling of our property. If you're new, we own 14 and a half acres, nine miles from this building uh, down in the uh, Congrove Harvest Green area in Richmond. And so December's giving was good, but not at the level that can sustain us for long term. So over the last couple of weeks, we've been having meetings, uh, lots of prayer, lots of discussion uh, about what, what's next steps, what are we going to do with the property. And next week, I hope to have an update for you, but it's been kind of long since I mentioned something, so I feel like I should mention something here. But what I'm asking you today is I'm asking you to pray. I'm asking you to pray for wisdom and favor as we are having discussions about our property and there are conversation and negotiations going on. And at the end of the day, no matter what happens, God has provided for our church. God continues to provide. God will provide. He has been with us and he is for us. And if you're new to our church, like Jacob said, I'd love for you to worship through giving with us. Uh, You're a generous church and we're just in a strange time in the world, in our country and in our church. And so we just want to respond faithfully to what's in front of us. If you have any questions, and if you're new, you probably do, or, or maybe you missed some of those updates for some reason. One, you should probably get our email update so you don't miss anything that goes on. Uh, two, you can email us. Email us at elders at crossbridge.cc. We have an Ask Us Anything culture, so ask us anything. Email us, and one of us will respond to you and help you with that. So let's pray one more time. Ask the Lord just to give us wisdom and favor in these days and conversations. Father, um, we do want to be a people that whether it is in great times or hard times, we are a people that magnify the name of Jesus the Christ, that we lift your name high, and that your song will be the song of our heart no matter what's happening in our lives. And Lord, in these times in our church family, I pray that you would give our leaders, our different teams, our, from all the different people involved in these conversations, Lord, wisdom, discernment, God, and Lord, provision. We need you to provide. And we want to see, Lord, your name glorified no matter what. We want to see more and more men, women, and children meet Jesus for the first time. And so, Lord, do that. Uh, we've been praying for renewal and revival over the month of January. And Lord, you've, you've done a great work. I know in my heart you've done a great work. And I, I thank you for last Sunday night, our night of worship and prayer. One of, one of the best nights of worship and prayer, I think, in our church's history. Just the sweet spirit, the expectancy and dependency that was just showcased in this room in the hearts of Crossbridge. I'm just so grateful for what you're doing in our church. And now, we, today, God, we get to sit in this, this great place and we get to open up your amazing word and hear the voice of your spirit speak to our hearts. So help me speak as I should. Open all our ears and hearts and say something with our name on it today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have a Bible, turn with me to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. If you Googled the word believe you would come up with over 1,750,000,000 results 
from wall art of any with any kind of like script that you can put. You can put the word believe all over your house. You could have a house that believes because you could fill it with as many different wall art um, out pieces out there that just have the word believe on it. We are supposed to, in our culture, uh, believe in yourself, uh, believe it'll be so, believe in your dreams, just believe in this house. We believe, um, you know, Ted Lasso, he believes in believe, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, one of the, you know, and so our country's just, we have this idea about believing. And one of the leading people that talks about this kind of idea of just believe and believe, believe in yourself, believe in your dreams, doesn't matter what you believe, as long as you believe, is Oprah Winfrey. Now, Oprah was interviewing an atheist not long ago, and this atheist was describing the sense of wonder that she felt at the edge of the ocean. And with Oprah then responding, saying, well, I don't call you an atheist. I think you believe in the awe and the wonder and the mystery, and then that is what God is to you. It's not the bearded guy in the sky. Now, the scriptures call us to believe. In fact, it is one of the major themes of the scripture. But the scriptures get very specific about what we're supposed to believe. It's more life-giving and more robust than just believing in belief or just believing in yourself or believing in your dreams. In fact, the entire Gospel of John, its theme is about believing. And we're going to start this brand new series today. Where we're going to look at John, chapters 1 through 3 uh, till Easter. And then we'll pick up John in a new series after Easter. But we're going to start in John chapter 20. Because in John 20, John tells you why he wrote his whole gospel account. And his gospel account is a little different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We'll talk more about that maybe next week. It's a little different because he has a kind of different point of view. It's all true. Everything he wrote happened. But like a good like documentary filmmaker, John puts it together because he's trying to convey a simple message. And that simple message he writes at the end of his book in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Now, Jesus did many other signs of the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now when it says that Jesus did many other signs, signs is what John calls miracles. He just doesn't just say, oh, Jesus did some miracles. No, every miracle he acts like is a sign pointing to something. In fact, John will have seven distinct signs that he'll write, put down in his gospel account that point to something about Jesus. Now you know that every sign is pointing somewhere. Uh, one of my favorite things about uh, driving to Florida is after uh, to see uh, Kathleen's sister lives in Florida and, and we've gone to Disney World a couple of times, but there's this point where all of a sudden all the signs change and it's like Disney World is coming. And never once have I pulled over and said, well, kids, we made it. Here it is, Disney World. Look at that. That's amazing. Let's get in the car and go home. Now, I'd save a lot more money and wouldn't have to stay for like five years, you know, to do, to do all that. But, um, but, you, but my kids are probably like, this is just a sign, Dad. We're not there yet. The miracles were all these signs pointing to something about Jesus. Well, why did he write these down? He wrote them down so that people would believe. Believe. And that word is going to be mentioned a hundred times in the Gospel of John. And throughout chapters 1 through 3, I would say it is the main theme of those three chapters. So this morning, I want to answer three questions. What does it mean to believe? What do we need to believe? And why do we need to believe? So number one. What does it mean to believe? Now, the word believe, besides being in, you know, wall art and philosophy and all that, we talk about it in different ways. Like if I said, do you think it's going to rain today? I don't believe so. You know, it's kind of a, this idea you have, but you're not certain because you live in the Houston area. And we should never be certain. Uh, when we believe facts, we believe something's true. We believe that water is wet. Uh, you will probably believe in gravity that if you just walked off this stage, you'd fall a little bit there. We believe things. We believe some things about people, but something can, sometimes we get different facts and that can change what we believe. And when scripture talks about believe, it uses a particular word. It uses the word pastil. It means to trust, to put one's faith into something or someone. See, believing in the Bible is not just agreement with facts. It's not just your opinion based on limited knowledge. It's the idea that you're on a hike, you're up in the mountains, and you get to this one part, and there's a cliff, and you look down, and you know, you know, it feels like it's like maybe it's a thousand feet down. You're just like, whoa, it's a long way down there. And the only way across the other side is on a wooden bridge. Now, you can say, I believe that bridge will hold me. But you don't really believe that until you walk across that bridge. 
The Bible knows nothing of just saying, yeah, I believe some facts, but you don't do anything with those facts. You, know, you actually think, no, I, I'm confessing some things that I know to be true, but I have to commit to following through on what I confess in. I got to walk across the bridge. Because if I say, oh, I believe it'll hold me, yeah, but I'm not going to do it. And I'm going to walk away. Then I really don't believe it. So we don't have just this mental adherence to a possible outcome, but we actually trust that something's true and act on it. The Apostle John did not write his gospel account so that you would just have some facts about Jesus and go, isn't that interesting? Isn't that true? He wrote these accounts so that you would put your, the trust of your life, everything about who you are, who you were, and who you want to be, into the hands of Jesus. So what does it mean to believe? It means that we confess that something is true and we commit our lives to living it and its implications. Now, what do we need to believe in? Verse 31, he tells us, These are written so you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. What are we supposed to believe? Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Let's walk through, through those two little phrases right there. First, we'll look at the Christ. Now, many of you know, and I've told you this before, but if you're new, you may not know that I've never heard this before. Christ is not Jesus' last name. We say it like that. People use his name in profane ways, you know, in, in, in the world and te television and movies. You know, they'll say Jesus Christ, acting like it's a big curse word, but they don't realize what they've actually just said. The Christ is Greek for Christos, which is the idea of this king. It's the Greek form of the Hebrew word for Messiah. It means anointed one. An anointed one was always a king. So every time someone's saying that, they're actually saying Jesus the king. And so they have no idea what they're saying when they say this. Now, Messiah has its roots in the Old Testament. It was a promised king, a perfect king that would come and make the world right between God and his people so we could be together. And Christians believe that Jesus is the king. We believe he was the promised king that God promised in the Old Testament. And we believe that he is a saving king. In fact, the message that Jesus is the Christ is the primary message of the New Testament. You'd be hard to find the Apostle Paul, James, John, Peter, the writer of Hebrews, say something like, Jesus, you know, Jesus is only a Savior. They'll talk about Jesus saving people. But over and over and over, you will see that they will refer to the fact that Jesus is is the Christ. One quick verse that shows how they were committed to it, Acts 5, 42. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. That the Messiah has come and the Messiah is Jesus. They were preaching that Jesus was the promised, eternal, saving king for God. Now you might say, well, what does that have to mean with anything? I thought I'm just supposed to believe in Jesus and I get forgiven for my sin. Matthew Bates writes, We fail to see that forgiveness flows not just through a person, but through a person in his official capacity as king. That means the reason Jesus can forgive you of your sins is because he's the king. He has the authority to do so. That's why after he rose from the dead, he told his disciples, Matthew records, that all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. If he didn't have all authority in heaven and earth, he could not forgive your sin. He's been given that authority by his father. He was granted that authority through his, through his obedience, through his death, and his resurrection. See, we believe as Christians that Jesus is the victorious, rescuing king. He was victorious over sin. He never sinned. He was victorious over Satan. He never gave in to his lives. He was victorious over death. He died as a perfectly righteous man, able to bear the penalty of all sin, pay it completely, and rise again from the grave. Victorious and rescuing. Since he's victorious, he can rescue people from the grip of sin, Satan, and death. Jesus fulfills God's promise in Genesis 3, where it says the seed of the woman would come and crush the head of the serpent and fix what is broken in the world. Jesus fulfills God's promise in Psalm 2 that God's king will end all injustice and all rebellion. He will judge the wicked, but have mercy on those who run to him. 
Jesus fulfills God's promise in Isaiah 53, the promise of a suffering servant who will be sinless, offered as a perfect payment for our sins. He takes the punishment of the guilty so the guilty can be declared innocent. Jesus fulfills God's promise in Daniel 7 of God ruling over all, an eternal, universal king with people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. So when we say that Jesus is the Christ, we are saying something big. We're saying that He is the promised King of eternity. We're saying something political. We're saying everything bows to Him, and everyone will bow to Him. We're saying something personal. He's my King. He's rescued me. I bow my life to Him. He's the King. He's the Christ. He is the one who will fix all that is broken in the universe. He is the one who will reign forever. He is the one who has made it so guilty humanity can be made right with God. He is the promised, rescuing, victorious king of the universe. So John says, I've written this, you might believe. You might trust in. You don't just say, I believe it's true. You actually walk on it. And what is he saying he wants you to believe is true? Jesus is the Christ, the saving, promised king. King, and that Jesus is the Son of God. See, Jesus isn't just an earthly king, he's divine. Only someone divine could do all that God promised in the Old Testament. Only someone divine could be trusted with absolute power and authority promised to the Messiah. Only someone divine could be the perfect sacrifice and payment for sin in the world. See, when we say that we believe Jesus is the Son of God, We believe that he is one with the Father. He is one with God. In fact, we'll see as we walk through John, John loves to point out this concept called the Trinity, that God is one God, one person, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God, excuse me, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he'll just bring this up over and over and over, that Jesus is divine. Believing in Jesus means we believe Jesus preexisted, as God the Son. He wasn't created when he was born at Christmas. He preexisted. He was sent by God the Father. He took on human flesh in fulfillment of God's promises to David. He died for our sins in accordance to the Scripture. He was buried, was raised on the third day according to the Scripture. Believing he's the Son of God and the Christ means we believe he appeared to many witnesses. It was not an illusion. It was not a fabrication. It was not a hallucination. Believing this means we mean he we believe he is enthroned at the right hand of God as the ruling Christ. He has sent the Holy Spirit to help his people apply his rule and his grace and will come again as final judge to rule. So this is the long form of what John means by one simple phrase that you would believe that he is the Christ, the Son of God. Not just I believe in my head but I'm going to walk across that bridge. I'm going to put the weight of my life on that. J.D. Greer writes, Biblical belief is the assumption of a new posture toward the lordship of Christ and his work on the cross. It's the assumption now of a new posture. Not just, yeah, that's true, but no, that's my life. That we're confessing he is a divine king, not just a saving king. And we're committing to him. So if you're a follower of Jesus, how often do you relate to Jesus as your king? You relate to him a lot as savior, helper. How often do you really relate to him on a daily basis as your king? He's in charge. Now, we're Americans. We don't like kings. We threw them off. You know, we like elected officials that we then can pulverize with our opinions. But Jesus is not elected. Jesus is king. He's been granted authority by his father. And that can never be taken away. You didn't vote for him and he doesn't care. You can complain. That's not going to bother him. We can't vote him out of office. We can't write our congressman. We can't write our, you know, our congress angel, you know, and say, hey, speak up for us, you know. Do you ever, do you relate to him as king that he calls the shots? about everything and anything and everyone. If you're new to relationship with Jesus, and that maybe that kind of bothers you a little bit that he's a king, you should take heart and take joy because Jesus is a loving king. That life is better. Life is more joyful 
more filled with love, more filled with peace when Jesus reigns. And you should discover what it means for Jesus to be more and more of your king. Maybe you're returning to church and you've been away for a while. And you think, oh great, he's the Christ. He's going to judge everybody. He's angry. But Jesus is gentle and welcomes all who come to him. And yes, he will judge the world one day. But you live at a time where his arms are wide open. And he says, come. You'll see throughout the Gospel of John how many times he says, come. You hungry in your soul? Come and eat. I'm the bread of life. Are you thirsty? Come and drink. I'm living water. Come to me. And maybe you're curious about God, but you don't identify as a Christian. Then you need to know that believing in Jesus means we don't identify. It's not becoming part of some social group or some American political group. It's about realigning your allegiances under the kingship of Jesus. See, John's statement that I want you to, these are written so you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, is a pushback to any idea that they, people would say back then, oh, Jesus was just a good rabbi, or what now people say, well, Jesus is a great teacher, but, but he's nothing more than that. This is a pushback against that to say, no, no, let me, let me, you make, make no mistake why I wrote these things. I want you to believe he's the saving king of the universe, and he's divine, the son of God. There's no middle ground there. The best quote about this is a very famous quote from C.S. Lewis. It's going to take about three slides, but I think it's worth it. I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, that I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher, He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him the Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. So what does it mean to believe? It means to trust, to put your confidence in. Not just that I confess it, I commit to it. What are we supposed to believe? That Jesus is the Christ, the King the Son of God. And then what do we get out of believing? What do we get out of believing? Why should we believe? Well, again, look at verse 31. These are written so you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. So what do we get out of it? Life in His name. Now, what does that mean? Well, the idea of life is a big theme in the Gospel of John. It's all over. We'll see it next week when we start in John chapter 1. This idea of eternal life, abundant life. In John 1, 4, it says, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. John 3, 16, probably the most famous verse maybe in the entire Bible. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus says He is the life, twice. He'll say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And he'll say, I am the resurrection and the life. He'll say this over and over, that coming to him gives you life. Now, there are two words for life in the scripture. We've talked about some of this before, but it's good review. One word is bios. It's the idea of your breath and your lungs, your physical life. And the other word is zoe. Now, zoe is the idea of being possessed with vitality, looking to the fullness of life. Now, bios is used 10 times in the Gospel of John. Zoe is used 135 times. And Lisa uh, Terker, she has a great quote about this in her study of uh, the Gospel of John. She, She writes, Jesus doesn't want us just to live with breath in our lungs, walking around as a shell of existence. He wants us to have a rare vitality, experiencing the fullness of soul someone should experience when Jesus himself does everyday life with us. A rare vitality experiencing 
fullness of soul, soul when Jesus himself does everyday life with us. I don't think there's one, any more intimate gospel account of the four gospels than John. Because Jesus will say things like, we're friends. Jesus will say things like, make your home with me. He'll say, I want you to consume me. Very intimate words of life with him. That this life then is a, is a vital fullness of life. See, the life that Jesus gives and will give at his return is a life of full human flourishing. The benefits are countless. But life in his name really comes down to two things. Number one, we live with Jesus. We do our life with Jesus. Eternal life, he'll say in John 17, is, just, is knowing him forever. It's not really about the place, it's about the who. It's about the person. A lot of times people think, well, you know, one day I'll go to heaven, I'll see aunt so-and-so, I'll see my mom, I'll see my grandmother, I'll see my dad, I'll see all that. Maybe you will, if they knew Jesus. But if that's all you have in the hope of the afterlife, you may not believe in what the Bible describes as the life after life after death. Because it's about being with Jesus and being with him forever. Life with Jesus, there's seven I am statements where Jesus will say, I am, and he'll say these things. He'll say, I am, and he says these things that he's for us. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I'm your light. We live with him as our nourishment, as our light and our guidance. When we live with Jesus, there are all kinds of benefits. Let me just give you three real quickly. Number one, the benefit of adoption, that we are God's children with the rights and privileges of being in his family. We will learn startle, very startling for some of us it'll be in this, in this gospel that not every human being is God's child. Every human being is God's creation made with dignity and love. But something has to happen for you to become God's child. You have to believe, trust in Jesus. And when you become God's child, you're adopted in his family. The almighty God of the Bible is now our father whom we can come to. We're, we're now a part of a family. It's not just us. Life with Jesus is about right standing with God, that legally now we're not guilty in front of the judge of the universe. It's understanding we know we committed sin, but the judge has applied our offense to a willing substitute and given us the freedom the willing substitute deserved. It's living a guilt-free, shame-free life. Life with Jesus realizes that every day I wake up, and if you blew it yesterday really bad, or you blew it on the way to church today, in the car, with the spouse, in front of the kids, everybody's crying when you pull in the parking lot until you step out of the car and you're like, good morning. <laughs> God didn't change the way he felt about you. Right standing with God. His perpetual smile towards you is what life with Jesus is life that we have with Jesus because of Jesus through Jesus this right standing with him doesn't mean I don't ever feel bad definitely there's conviction Jesus will tell us in the gospel of John that's why he sends the Holy Spirit to convict us but that conviction is always to set us free and it's never a sign that his smile and his affection has gone away. God's empowering presence, the Holy Spirit. John will spend a whole chapter telling us about Jesus' teachings on the Holy Spirit, who helps us sense God's love, makes the scriptures come alive, changes our desire, produces new character, what we call the fruit of the Spirit, and empowers us to serve and live for God. We live with him because he lives within us. I mean, this is full, final, and forever salvation. Again, one of the most startling claims in John's gospel, Jesus will say, I am not a way, I am the way. No one comes to the Father through me. No, he'll say it several times, not just in that famous verse. No one comes to the Father through him, but through Jesus. We have reconciliation, peace, union, atonement, redemption, holiness, enrichment, victory, triumph, exaltation, glory, rule, return from exile, rest, feasting, life with the most wonderful, enjoyable being in the universe forever, an everlasting, resurrected life in the new heavens and new earth. This is all ours. When we 
trust, commit, confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. We live with Him. And the second thing it looks like, life in His name, is we live for Jesus. Jesus doesn't just save us from something, like eternity away from Him. He doesn't just save us from hell. He doesn't just save us from sin. He doesn't just save us from Satan. He doesn't just save us from death. He saves us for something. For himself. And while we're here, we realize that all of life is all for Jesus. Because if I believe he's the Christ, he's the king, then I live for his pleasure. Everything I do should be about him and for him. My life should be the song we sang before the sermon about magnifying Christ. And it's the idea of magnifying, not like a magnifying glass, but like a, but like a telescope, something that's humongous, kind of making it appear closer and as it is. So if all of life is all for Jesus, and we're living for Him, and He is King, then you just go through every area of life and say, if He's the King, what does He say about this? Regarding money, Jesus is King. So what does He say to do with it? Regarding sex and sexuality, Jesus is king. What does he will? Regarding power, Jesus is king. What does he say about authority, working with our talents in the world? How should we treat others who are less fortunate? Regarding purpose, Jesus is king. What is his purpose for his people? Well, his purpose for his people is to make disciples, to help other people meet Jesus and follow him. I mean, John said this was written so people might believe. And there's all debate and scholarship, and you can just you know, go down a big rabbit hole. Is that so, like, you know, followers of Jesus will like, grow stronger in their belief, or so people that don't know Jesus will believe in Jesus? And the answer is yes. That if you're a follower of Jesus, only reading about Jesus in the book of John and seeing how incredible he is, that will only deepen your relationship with him, only make you marvel and be amazed at who he is and what he's about and just drive your devotion. But if you don't believe or you have doubts or you've started, you know, what's so like kind of hip in our culture right now, you know, kind of deconstructing your faith, well, are you deconstructing your faith, the faith, or are you just deconstructing your faith? Because I think you meet the real Jesus, you realize he is more thrilling, more wonderful, more amazing, more compelling than anyone can ever present him to be. He is amazing. And so what if we as a church decide, as we study the Gospel of John, we're going to be committed to deepening our relationship with Jesus. So we're all, whoever can, and I think most of us should be able to do this, we're going to commit to be here. We're going to walk through this gospel together. If you're not in a community group, you should get in a community group. We're going to study this gospel in our community groups. What if we all committed to helping people take the next step in believing? What if we all just said, hey, this was written so people might believe. How are we helping John in that? Who can we invite? Who is our one that we're praying for that's far from God that needs to meet Jesus? They don't believe Jesus is the Christ. Or they're long gone from that being the center of their life. They need to return. Or they need to come to Him for the first time. Every week in this series, something about Jesus will come out that will speak even to the hardest of heart. Because John wrote this. So that people would believe. They believe he's the Christ, the Son of God. And that by believing, they have life. They have this vigorous, wonderful, abundant, lasting forever life with him and life for him. Is all of your life all for Jesus? Because then are you really believing that he is the Christ and the Son of God? And if you do believe it, And you say, no, I confess it, and I commit to it. Does your life look like that? That all of your life is all for Jesus. Look at the verse again. But these are written, so you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in His name. So, 
In closing, what does it mean to believe this? It means we confess. We confess that it's true. Jesus is who he said he is. He's done what he said he would do. And, and I, my life can be changed. I, I'm going to base my life on these things. I'm confessing it's true. We commit. I don't just say the bridge can hold my weight. I walk across the bridge. I don't just say, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. I now entrust him my past, present, and future. My past, he's the only one that can forgive it. My present, he should be the one setting the priorities and guiding me. My future, he's the only one with whom it's secure. Your retirement account may not be secure. Your stock options may not be secure. But your full and final salvation is secure in Jesus. So I'm going to commit and run everything through the grid of he is the divine king. I want to live with him, and I want to live for him. And then John brings up one more thing that we'll see, that it means to believe. And it's interesting because I don't, I don't, it's just like this weird thing he kind of puts through his gospel. To believe means we're consuming. Because why does he say, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Why does he say, if you're thirsty, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He'll have a whole conversation with this lady, um, you know, that has this really messed up past, broken relationships and everything. And he'll say, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me for a drink. And he's at a well in the middle of the day and he has nothing to draw water with and he's not carrying a cooler on him. So why would he say all these things? Does he, he doesn't mean that we literally, you can't drink a person. And he's not talking about, I, you know, I would argue, he's not talking about communion or the Lord's Supper when he says, eat my flesh and drink my blood. He's talking about that believing is putting my attention and affection and allegiance on him and consuming in my heart all that he is. I have a deep need for security. So I consume Jesus that you are the Lord of the universe and my life is secure in your hands. The world doesn't feel safe and I might get hit by a bus later today, but I'm always secure in him. I consume the fact that my heart needs satisfaction. And if I don't come to you, Jesus, I will go to the trivial, dark things of the world that my flesh wants so I consume that you're better. You satisfy my heart with your love. I consume that you're the bread of life. You're the living water. Only you will satisfy. I have to have faith in this. I have to confess it and commit and be consuming that he is the bread of life we eat, the living water we drink, the lamb we trust, the way we go, the truth we believe, and the life we live. This is what John's after. This is what we're going to go after. So, we're going to talk about how believing is the key to living. Confessing, committing, and consuming Jesus is the key to the life we all want and the life everyone craves. So Christian, if there's, you believe, but you know there's areas to grow. There's a great prayer in one of the Gospels where a guy says, I believe, help my unbelief. It's not disbelief. You believe he's true, but you have unbelief. Your, your confession's a little weak. Your commitment's a little weak. You're definitely not taking your heart to him to consume his good character. So maybe you need to say, God, strengthen me. Help my unbelief. Help my unbelief these days. And then all of us probably need to answer. Do you really believe? Have you really confessed that he is Lord? Do you really confess in your heart he rose from the dead? If so, have you committed your life to him? Have you given him your allegiance and your loyalty? If Jesus does not have your allegiance and loyalty, you did not confess that he was the Christ, the Son of God. You may have prayed a prayer to feel better about yourself, but the Bible knows nothing of a person that just receives the forgiveness and then stiff arms God the rest of your life. That's not you receiving grace. Receiving grace is, I have nothing. So slay me or save me. And if you save me, I'm yours. 
And that brings loyalty and allegiance. And then consuming. Where are you taking your heart? Do you believe he is the bread of life? The living water? That he's the lie of the world? That what you're looking for won't be found on a website? In a picture? With something you bought that was new? More money? It will only be found in him. John wrote these things so that we might believe that he is the Christ, the one we've all been wanting, the one everyone votes for every four years. They might put down someone's name that's red or someone's name that's blue, but in the every human heart, there's an ache for something. It's the ache for the Christ. And that's why no human candidate can ever satisfy that. They'll never deliver. Only Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Do you believe? Let's pray. So with your head bowed and eyes closed, you can't have a sermon like this without asking if people want to put their faith and belief in Jesus today. Maybe you're returning to God and you need a fresh start with Him. And you, you think you became a Christian at one time. You don't know if you became a Christian at one time. You're, it's been a part of your life, but He's not been the center. He's definitely not been the key. Then come to Him right now. Open your heart to Him. Or maybe you know in your heart of hearts, I, I've never really taken a, a first step of confessing, committing, and consuming that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And you can take that step right now. Open your heart to Him. There'll be a prayer on the screen. And you can just make those words into your words. And I'll, I'll read it out loud and pray it out loud. And you can just pray it in your heart. And it's not the words. It is the faith in your heart, the trust in your heart that He is the Christ, the Son of God. So if you need a fresh start today, you need to take a first step today. I want you to open your heart and pray this with me. God, I know I'm a sinner. I have lived for other things first besides you. I believe that Jesus died in my place to pay for my sins. I believe Jesus rose from the dead and is alive today. And from this day forward, I surrender my life to you. And with your help, I will live for you first. I receive now the gift of your grace. Thank you for making me your child through Jesus and giving your Holy Spirit to me. Now, if you're praying that today, you're, you're coming back to him. You have a, you're taking a, a fresh start or a first step. And you're confessing today afresh, I believe. I'm going to count to three and I want you to raise your hand. I just want to pray for you. Let me be your pastor and pray for you. And just make that little moment between us. And you're saying today, no, I want that fresh start. I believe. I'm taking that first step. I believe. So take a moment. It might be like, I don't know, raising my hand. What will happen? Well, I'll pray for you. That's what will happen. And it'll actually help solidify what just happened in your heart because you're taking another step of living it out. So one, God loves you so much. He gave you Jesus for you. Two, he's been pursuing you and he brought you here today. And then three, raise your hand. You prayed that prayer for a fresh start or first step. And just hold it up for a second. And God bless you. Keep it up for a second. Just make sure I see everybody. It's dark out there, but the bright lights are in my eyes. Yeah. God bless you. You can put your hands down. Father, for those who raise their hands, I just pray right now that you would just give them a sense of your love and your kindness and your grace. <laughs> that you would strengthen their belief in you. They would realize that by believing their heart that Jesus is risen from the dead and confessing with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, the scripture says we will be saved. And so I pray, 
that these people would know that their salvation does not rest on being in this church or raising their hand, but it's based on Jesus. Bless them, Lord. For all of us in the room, Lord, that are followers of you, strengthen our faith now. We respond to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you uh, raised your hand, I'd encourage you to fill out a Connect card and tell us you did that. We'd love to encourage you to take your next step with Jesus. Maybe you didn't raise your hand. You you were just kind of freaked out about that. I totally get it. I have one friend that makes people stand up in the service, so it could have been worse. Um, But but here's, you know, right now we live in an age of grace, and that grace is come to Jesus. And so maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you want to tell somebody. Tell somebody you came with. Come tell me after the service or write on the Connect card. No, I... I, I, I gave myself to Jesus today. There's one in the seat pocket in front of you. You, you can text CB Connect to 97000 and you can fill it out and tell us. Now let's respond in worship. We respond to the gospel through singing, we respond to the gospel in praying, we respond to the gospel through giving. So let's worship the Lord now. Will you stand with me?